And now let's go to one of the biggest uh, furniture manufacturers in the world. Meet Andreas Sorens, head of climate for the Inter IKEA Group. At 1.5 degree company, IKEA is committed to becoming climate positive by 2030 without using carbon offsets and enabling further reductions in society. Welcome to the broadcast, Andreas Ahrens. Uh, please give us some of your thoughts and then I'm going to move into an interview with you. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Uh, good day and afternoon. Uh, welcome into my home office using a lot of IKEA furniture. So at IKEA, we want to become climate positive. And to reach this, we really need to drive exponential change throughout the value chain because time is ticking and we only have 10 years. And for us, I mean, it comes as a complete common sense that we need to commit ourselves to contribute to limiting climate change to 1.5. Because IKEA's vision is to create a better everyday life for many people. And we know this will really impact the normal people's lives in the coming generations. So we need to act now and we're fully committed. And just one thing that we can really drive change, now we're talking about industry, but just thinking about the magnificent changes that we can do is also looking into IKEA. I mean, we are famous for our meatballs and also if we can change our products, like the one plant-based meatball that we just launched is one of the true IKEA icons. And we as business, we really need to rethink our business. Can we still serve a ball with sauce, but in a different way, such as and then why should we as a company drive these things? Well, for us at IKEA, it's a comp we would like to take the full responsibility of anything that IKEA business impacts on climate change. So we need to look into all greenhouse gas emissions that have happened along the whole IKEA value chain, all from how we source materials to how we are produced and transported to where you as a customer meet us and the store and then how you even travel home from the store, use the parks at home, and then the end of life. This is our responsibility. And this is what needs to be cut in half by 2030. And why is it then relevant? I mean, if you look into our footprint, it's 20, almost 25 million tons. And this is a gas, it, it's hard to understand how much it is, but comparing it, this equals to roughly half of Sweden's greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis or roughly 0.1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So what we do as a business really makes a lot of sense. We need to be part of the solution. We do contribute with greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to be part of the solution as well. So therefore, it's not just our responsibility to cut emissions in half by 2030, but we need to do our utmost to reduce as much greenhouse gas emissions in society as possible. Both what is coming from our business, but anything we can do beyond that. And that is why we want to reduce more greenhouse gas emissions than our value chain emits while growing the IKEA business. If we still need to improve the lives of the many people. We talked about the emerging company, air economies as well. And people are improving their way of living. They should have that opportunity, but not at the expense of people or planet. So, in short, what it means we become climate positive then? Well, if we're just going to continue as business as usual, we'll by 2030 emit almost three times as much greenhouse gas emissions than we do today. And this needs to end. So, therefore, the main priority is to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions by striving towards 100% renewable energy, not just in our stores, but also how we produce our product, the transports, the use at home, everywhere. We also need to use more sustainable materials and food, such as the plant ball, but also 100% recycled materials or renewable materials. Third one, we also need to address sustainable consumption and enable a circular economy, transforming from a linear one into a circular one, where all that key products you buy can be repaired, uh, refurbished, et cetera. So we can continue to live and not end up uh, incinerated uh, or end up a landfill. 
But this is not enough. We also need to look into how we can remove CO2 within our value chain. So for instance, looking into the, all the forest we source from or all of the agriculture where we get, for instance, cotton from, where 1% of the cotton production of the world goes into IKEA. So the, an enormous potential here to change management practices in forestry and agriculture within the value chain. We don't need to do offsetting. So that will take us to cutting our emissions in half. And then, of course, we have, we have also seen, like, what can we do else in society? Well, we want to inspire and enable more than 1 billion people to live a healthy and sustainable life within the limits of the planet by 2030. And we would like to do this without carbon offsets so these reductions in society. And one such way to enable a sustainable living is, for instance, can we then offer solar panels to our customers? We may have bought the TV cell phone, which is electricity or a computer, which you can't buy at IKEA, but we can enable them to generate electricity at home to make sure that they don't have any climate footprint. So through this is how we then become climate positive. And I think the key mentality is not if we should do this, but it's really how we have no choice. So let's just dedicate ourselves and commit and then figure out how will we do this? We shouldn't hesitate. This is a clear necessity for humankind to make this change. And we all need to work together. It's been stated throughout the whole uh, conference here, how we need to innovate, find new solutions, but also that most solutions already exist. And we need to work together as well to scale them up. One such example of both innovation and scaling up is here. You see an ocean container here, but what you don't see is that is actually the first ocean container which uses sustainable biofuel with some wastes in from a paper mill and used cooking oil. And here at IKEA, we team up with the shipping company CMA CGM, and together we develop the first ocean container using biofuel, which you see here. Now we have made sure we have a proof of concept, it works, but then we need to now scale it up. And that is the journey we are on. We can enable this if we only work together. So we're looking into the whole value chain. Well, how are we actually gonna cut this in half? I mean, this is like a gigantic task. I mean, the whole industry is mainly sitting here in materials. So what do we do as a company? Well, we lead with facts. And I think this is also a key word. Digitalization can really help us. It's not just setting goals, but it's to turn goals into concrete actions so that we can take decisions and actions now and not just set goals, but direct actions. What can be done now? And what do we need to innovate going forward? We need to have both as an approach. And to just take one example, let's zoom into the production. So this is the manufacturing of IKEA products. It could be a Billy bookcase. It could be the plant ball I just showed, or the IKEA cap one. If you just break that 11% into small pieces, it looks a bit like this. We know that our suppliers, how much electricity they're using. We know what type of electricity they're using. We know that that's a bit more than half of that 11% I just showed. The other parts come from heating. So fuels which we use in textile production, but it can also be the kilns for when we produce glass or ceramics for cookingware that we use at home. But through this, we can then assess, okay, but what is then possible by having on-site solar? And we know that it can roughly cover 10-15% of a supplier's electricity consumption, not more. So the rest we need to buy from the grid. And by using analytically, we know exactly where this electricity is consumed, not just country, but exact coordinates. So it's like in a precise province in say China or a state in the US, we know this. So we need to work both promoting on-site both panels, but also how we can bundle the electricity consumption supplies and together secure that that is renewable and help our supplies to reach this. We also look into the heating and we know that we, we cannot have fossil fuel here. We do need to transform it into renewable energy and preferably through electrification. So can we take that glass uh, kiln 
and make it and convert it from natural gas into electricity. And then we use that, that electricity is coming from wind power. Some cases we might still need biofuels, but then it's key that it's sustainable biofuels and doesn't cause deforestation or other negative land use change, which can actually mean that the biofuel has a higher climate footprint than the fossil fuel. It could also lead, if it's not sustainable, that we reduce the resilience in the ecosystem of nature as well, increasing the effects of climate change. So we do need to work analytically and really push action. Looking into materials, we, we know IKEA, I mean, we, we use a lot of board materials. I mean, in the bookshelves, in the wardrobes, and in the kitchens and so on. It's a huge part of our material weight, but it's less of our actual climate footprint. Metals, which is only 8% of our weight, is actually almost 30% of our climate footprint. And here we rely on innovative projects such as hybrids in the steel industry, where coal is replaced with hydrogen in the steel industry. But we cannot wait until then, since the pilot uh, site is up to 2035. So we need to act now for increasing recycled content, but maybe also as a retailer, change from using metals into wood. So that we take conscious decisions of which supply chain we use as well. These are the choices we can do when we develop products. We can choose which material we want. But we still need to improve the materials. So let's just also break down that board material as well. And since we're a Scandinavian company, let's look into Denmark and play Lego with our material footprint. So we know that this is a particle board. This is used for bookshelves and kitchen stuff. So we know that logging operations is roughly 11%, so logging machines. We also know that the glue that's used in particle board is actually a significant part of the climate footprint. And we know that the, room, the energy, so the fossil energy or fossil electricity used in board production today is almost 25%. And by free concrete actions here, converting to recycled particle boards, getting a sustainable bio-based glue and hundreds of renewable energy at the board factory, we can, in principle, eliminate the climate footprint of board materials, which is then standing for 24% of IKEA's climate footprint of materials, which is roughly 40. So it's a huge movement we can hear, and by clear actions. And this is what we need to do. We need to break down the footprint, slice the elephant, and really enable and take actions today. This is what we need. And what we need in society as well. I mean, people want, what should we do? Well, first of all, we all need to unite under 1.5 part, which sets the whole framework and policies how to reach this. And it's not just companies, but it's also countries and so on. Let's unite for this and just set that mission. We also need to make sustainable uh, solutions affordable. It cannot be a luxury for a few. And it's especially true now in the COVID-19 situation, as also as Nick has been on to previously, how do we make, make and spread it across the globe? We need to make sustainability affordable. And as I said, we need to make it tangible and easy to understand. What can you do as a private person, as a company, as a country, to make it tangible? And I think that the 36 actions in the experimental roadmap is really clear and it empowers people to take that action. And most of all, Let's not forget that when we reduce CO2, not sacrifice climate adaptation of trillions, especially when it comes to renewable materials and renewable fuels, because it makes us more susceptible to becoming climate change and how it affects both business and society. If we do this, we will then be on a good way. And together, we can make the seemingly impossible possible. Well, thank you very much, Andreas. I love the together in your in your framing of the, the ending of your talk, especially. Um, do your customers care enough for you to do this? Uh, is it too late in the game for IKEA? Or, I mean, what is what are the stakes here for you to do this major pivot here? Well, we do actually know that most of our customers do care about sustainability, and many want to make actually a sustainable choice but many find it's actually too expensive or they don't know how to do it as well. So that is why it's so important for us as a company to inspire customers to make the right choice, but also 
that is affordable for all the people with thin wallets and not just one who has thick one. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. Um, how about your supply chain? Because you're a major company and you need to be able to affect all the way out into the, the bottom line of your su supply chain. But how, what, what is your take on how you can affect all the way in, your, in that direction? And that's the best question to answer. Like, it depends. I mean, if it's, uh, say, in manufacturing, we, we do have a direct relation with our suppliers. We work very long term with our suppliers, on average 12 years. So here we, we set the goals and together we create roadmaps uh, and investment plans and so on to make it happen. Then, and as I was on to when it comes to materials, I mean, it, we are a small player. I mean, IKEA is not a big player when it comes to steel. So here we do need to work together with companies who share the same vision. We maybe cannot put requirements on us, but we can partner like we did for shipping industry. And together we can create these sustainable solutions and also make them uh, sustainable. So different approaches for different parts of the supply chain is the short answer. Thank you, Andreas. And do you expect compet competitors to follow suit? How is your role as sort of a, of a plow in this movement? Well, I mean, we hope not just competitors, but like any company. And I think that's the role of all company representatives here. We all need to work together and we shouldn't take pride in like the secret of our solutions. We should really share them because this is not for the survival of us as a company, but this is for society as a total. So we need to actually enable and share as much as we possibly can with, of course, respect to competition, but... We're not doing this to gain any competitive advantage. We're doing it for, for people and planet. Thank you, Andreas. Let's now introduce, introduce a panelist. Meet Jennifer Hartley, president of the Americas BT Global. One of the first companies in the world to adopt science-based targets, BT has reduced their operational emissions by 42% in four years and helped their customers save three tons of carbon for every ton BT emits. BT has also pledged to reach net zero emissions by 2045 and are committed to a green recovery from the corona pandemic. Hello Jennifer, welcome to the program. Could you please tell us a bit more about BT's climate activities? Absolutely, and thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here today. I am delighted, actually, that just last week, BT joined the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and announced our support of the one and a half degrees Celsius business playbook. Over the last 25 years, we've been a huge leader in climate action. We were actually one of the first companies in the world to link our carbon reduction target with science, and we've pledged to become a net zero carbon emissions business by 2045. So, what are we doing to actually get there? First, renewable energy. We're already at 100% in the UK and we'll be at 100% worldwide by December of this year. Second is we're decarbonizing our fleet. We actually have the second largest fleet in the UK with over 32,000 vehicles, and we need to change those to ultra low emissions vehicles. And lastly, as we just talked about, we just heard Andreas talk about, let's not forget about the supply chain. BT is proud to be one of the founding members of the 1.5 Supply Chain Leaders Initiative, together with the other founding partners, Ericsson, Ikea, and Telia. And in this global pandemic moment, the opportunity is there for a truly green recovery if government, business, and society work together to not just learn, but to change to our next normal, because only through collective action can we reach net zero. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Let's now move to the next panelist. Meet Edda Aradotir, CEO of Carbfix, the company that mitigates climate change by turning CO2 emissions into stone. The Carbfix technology works by imitating natural carbon removal, but at an accelerated rate. Within two years, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is turned into stone underground. The technology has been applied directly to power plants and to facilities that capture carbon from the air. Carbfix is on a mission to substantially reduce global CO2 emissions and has a goal of capturing 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide by 2030. Hello, Edda. I'm curious, I'm, as I'm sure many viewers are, how can you scale your technology exponentially? Well, I mean, it's really the question of, of tapping into the emission sources. Instead of... Uh, releasing CO2 from the chimneys, from industries and power plants to capture at the source. 
and then our technology comes in uh, and actually injects the CO2 into specific rock formations that are found widely on our planet. And um, their natural reactions, which actually nature has already been applying over millions of years for regulating CO2 levels in the atmosphere, these reactions take over and rapidly transform the CO2 into stone. So essentially our technology is only assisting nature already applying the methods that it has uh, perfected. But how can it be scaled? I mean, you're, you're based in, in Iceland where you have perfect renewable, uh, renewable energy sources. How can you scale this on a global level? Well, we, we of course intend to uh, assist uh, emitters throughout the globe uh, by licensing our technology. So it's not something we will be doing on our own. Uh, we are aware that togetherness is really the key word here, as has already been stated. So we will be focusing on licensing the technology, providing assistance and guidance, uh, but at the same time also uh, developing our hubs concept, which will allow for um, sort of uh, through CO2 transport networks, uh, scaling up uh, injection of CO2 at the most favorable uh, injection formations throughout the globe. So it's really uh, a mixture of, of licensing our technology and also doing our part actively uh, in scaling up the technology. Thank you very much, Edda. Let's move to the next panelist. Meet Todd Brady. Director of Global Public Affairs and Sustainability at Intel Corporation. Intel has outlined a set of global sustainability challenges to overcome and specific goals to reach by 2030, such as having 100% renewable energy across their manufacturing operations, decreasing scope 1 and 2 emissions by 10%, and creating a collective approach to reducing emissions for the global semiconductor industry. With these goals, they hope to mark a new era of corporate responsibility. Hi, Todd. Welcome to the program. Uh, Thank you. In Intel is rightly associated with Moore's Law that has inspired the exponential uh, roadmap. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about Intel's work to reduce emissions? Yes, uh, Moore's Law states that transistors will double uh, every couple of years. And we've tried to apply that same uh, outlook as we look to reducing our carbon emissions. And uh, one of the things that perhaps we're unique with this esteemed panel here today is uh, we're a manufacturing organization, which brings some unique challenges when we look at our carbon footprint. However, we've been able to decouple our manufacturing growth with our carbon footprint, that is reduce our carbon footprint while continuing to grow our manufacturing capabilities. And we've done that really in three ways. One would be to um, reduce the emissions from our manufacturing operations themselves. Uh, that has been through chemical substitution and employing abatement technologies. Number two is investing in renewable energy. 100% of our uh, energy in the US and, and Europe comes from renewable sources. And uh, we plan, as you heard from the introduction, to grow that uh, over the next decade worldwide to achieve 100%. And then the third area is investing heavily in energy conservation. Uh, we do that year over year in our uh, manufacturing operations, uh, setting aside money to invest to reduce the energy that we need to use and therefore reducing our carbon emissions. Well, thank you very much, Todd. Let's now uh, go to uh, the panel talk uh, and see what Andreas has, what questions you have for the panel. Yeah, so where to push us? Maybe I should go for you, Todd, first at Intel. Uh, I'm also wondering, since this is an in industry transformation, we do need to look into materials. And since we're using a lot of circuits as well, and plastic is a huge part. So how can we together uh, create traceability of materials, including the renewable feedstock for bioplastics, but also traceability of what's a old materials, which we don't want to put back into the circular uh, material loop again. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, your question gets to maybe a, a broader point of application of technology to help the world become more sustainable. The uh, example you gave of, of mineral tracing is certainly one example, which uh, we have begun working on and working with others and um, coming up with methodologies to trace that using IT. 
uh, when you start looking at IT in general and, and how you could potentially use it, the, the, the limits, uh, it, it's really limitless, uh, whether that's smart manufacturing, smart buildings, smart infrastructure, on and on and on, embedding IoT solutions, AI solutions, 5G solutions into the future, uh, as we have done that even in, in simple applications such as buildings, building a new building and integrating tens of thousands of sensors and making that a smart building. We've seen efficiencies of 30% or more. Uh, so we, we're really excited about the future of using technology to solve sustainability challenges. Thank you, Todd. More questions, Andreas? Yeah, I'm also wondering, for, I mean, with carb fix as well, I mean, the question is like how to secure the carbon capture storage is only used when it's really needed and doesn't become a new normal because I mean everything needs to transition into renewable energy right absolutely i fully agree uh, and and in fact uh, carbfix is actually born within the renewable energy sector it was developed within the geothermal sector which is fully renewable but we have a source of co2 being an integral part of the energy production chain because it is co2 of volcanic origin and we will, we are mainly focusing on industries that that where the same applies, where we have CO2 emissions being an integral part of the ongoing production. This is, for example, the metals production uh, applies to cement, steel to an extent. So, so these are really, you know, the factors, the the industries that where we where we are mainly focusing on. And as you already mentioned in your talk, for the steel industry, for example, we are very much aware that there is ongoing innovation, but we do not necessarily foresee uh, installment of of plants with, with this new type of technology until uh, significantly into the, into the future. And as we all know, we don't have time to wait. So in the meantime, we can retrofit the existing steel plants with technology like ours. Thank you. Andreas, do you have a question for Jennifer? Uh, this is the last question we can take in this panel before we're letting Nick oh. in. Of course, and I get inspired a bit by our slogan here, beyond limits. So the question is, I mean, how can we together empower the many customers to use renewable electricity and like really make that complete power switch at home? Thank you, Andreas. You know, I think the answer is technology really needs to be at the heart of how we tackle climate change. Often I find us looking at this challenge more from a lens of economics, but the beauty of digitization is that it's a topic where the business case is already written itself. It's become a no brainer from an economic standpoint, but it's also become a no brainer from a climate perspective. And I think that's one of the factors that's really going to help us accelerate climate action. Last year, services like broadband, teleconferencing and cloud networking helped save BT's customers 13 million tons of carbon. That's the equivalent of the carbon emissions of nearly 3 million UK households. And at the same time, those services generated over five and a half billion in revenue of pounds for us last year. So I think at a high level, digitization in industry can really be boiled down into two broad categories. The first is digitization of machines and the second ways of working. So by digitizing our operational backbones, we'll drive up efficiency and productivity through the use of technologies like AI and IoT. We've actually developed a digital manufacturing proposition for our largest multinational customers. And a key focus area of this is using AI, artificial intelligence, to reduce energy consumption and improve the carbon footprint of manufacturing sites. So for each production run, we can calculate an energy efficiency index and recommend an optimal course of action. And one client actually reduced their carbon footprint by over 3,000 tons, saving $250,000 a year for just one major plant. And that is templated and reusable. So now we have versions for heavy industry, marine vessels, hospitals, and data centers. And I'd be happy to talk to you and Todd about it for IKEA and Intel. Um, and then the digitization of how we work includes not just improving workflows, but also about enabling our people to work more flexibly, increase choice, increase collaboration, and hopefully even make the future workplace more democratic in some cases. The Center for Economics and Business Research found that connecting the UK to full fiber broadband by 2025 would deliver a 60 million pound, 60 billion pound boost to the UK's economy. But it also revealed that half a million people could be brought back into the workforce at least 400,000 more people could work from home and 300 million com commuting trips could be saved annually. And so to make it personal, 
I think many of us have probably had a virtual happy hour as we've worked to stay connected. And at BT Global, we've also been leveraging Zoom's capabilities and other technologies from partners like Cisco and Microsoft to help our customers connect remotely while preserving productivity and human connection through video. And the math of a virtual meeting is really compelling. So to fly from San Francisco to New York for an in-person meeting has a carbon cost of 1,500 pounds of CO2, while a virtual meeting is just nine pounds. That's less than 1% of the impact. So in other words, it would take 32 trees an entire year to recover the in-person meeting versus one tree in two months to tackle the virtual. So digitization can help and it can reinforce the business case on net zero, but in order to move faster, we have to establish a next normal that takes advantage of what we've learned during this pandemic. We can meet and collaborate and work and create virtually with a significantly lower carbon impact. And I think we need to rely on technologies in ways that we didn't fully trust or understand before. And we should trust in the power of technology to transform our ways of working and our operational backbones to accelerate the date when we, when we reach net zero. If just one virtual meeting can reduce our carbon impact by 99%, then I think it's pretty clear uh, what the path is for us to get to net zero if we're willing to take the leap. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you, Edda. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you, Todd. And it's, it will be very interesting to follow your collaboration after this talk and just keep up the great, great work you're doing. Thank you.